Hello, Byzantine history students. This is the lecture effectively. Whoops, got to take care of uh, some things here in my in my shack. Effectively dealing with Gregory's chapter eleven. Um, he calls it the apogee. This is the height of Byzantine power, due largely to the uh, the activities of of two generals who set the stage for Basil II to have a long and relatively prosperous reign. But as is often the case with history, generally, the seeds for the fall, the seeds for the decline of Byzantium, are really planted at the very height of Byzantine power. And so I'm adding to the title, uh, the apogee of Byzantine power, I'm adding the decline, because we also see a decline that moves toward a series of events that have come to be called in the West the Crusades. How we get to the Crusades, why... Byzantium hits a crisis which requires Western intervention is really the kind of the subplot or the, the, the theme of, of this lecture. The Macedonian dynasty owed most of its success to the fact that very few of the dynasty actually held power. Others, others would, who were very capable rulers, tended to run the show while this or that Macedonian emperor or empress um, was on the throne. Constantine the Seventh was something of an exception to that. He was a success because of his scholarship and the lessons learned from his father-in-law, who, by the way, wasn't one of the Macedonian dynasty, Roma Romanos the First. His son, Romanos the uh, Second, Constantine the Seventh's son, maintained the status quo but he accomplished very little before his death in 963. The widow Theophano, it's, you keep encountering this name, it comes back and forth, it generally refers to a number of people by the same name, so just a warning. The widow of Romanus II decided to cement her power with a, mar with a marriage to the great general, um, the pale death of the Saracens, Nikephoros Phokas. Now, she knew what she was doing. Nikephoros Phokas had been declared emperor by the army um, directly upon the death of Romanus II, and she, <laughs> seeing which way the wind was blowing and what the army was up to, decided that she would uh, make sure that she didn't lose power along the way. Phokas established hardline policies in regard to the Islamic frontier, and this was very effective. He be believed that the the way to deal with the expansion of Islam was to reverse the expansion of Islam, kill them, and take the territory back. He also uh, pursued a policy of serious economic stability at home. The idea that somehow the protection of the peasants was the government's issue, or that the, the uh, central government in Constantinople should be engaged in the maintenance of welfare within the realm, was regarded by Nikephros Phokas as pretty much a waste of money. Trade alliances, which involved taxes both on domestic and foreign property owners, every time money changed hands, the government received something, this secured the realm financially. The, the austerity measures of Nikephros Phokas, combined with his military policy, made, made the realm really very stable throughout his reign. Well, he was a great general, and uh, known for his piety, and generally well-liked, this didn't apply to his wife. His policies worked. Byzantine power grew, trade flourished. Constantine VII had set the stage. Nikephoros Phokas followed through. The problem with Phokas was that Theophano didn't like him very much. He placed duty above everything. He actually was devoted to his job as, as a general, and that means he wasn't devoted to her. And he would also spend, when he wasn't in the field, an inordinate amount of time at monasteries. Uh, this, this really didn't please his wife much either. And, darn it, he was ugly. Um, this is not what Theophano wanted to spend her, her youth and beauty on, was, was maintaining focus when he didn't care for her, and frankly, didn't have much in the way of physical beauty to recommend him. 
so we have something of a, a love triangle that develops. Um, John Zemiskis had been handpicked by Phokas to take over the eastern frontier, the battle against uh, expansion of Islam. He was a relative and apparently also something of a lover of Theophano, and she convinced him to murder Nikephoros, his friend and benefactor, and to take over. Well, Zemiskis did. He got himself promptly excommunicated for murdering and his, uh, his boss, and Theophano, probably not what she had intended, was sent to a monastery. Oops. Predictably, the coup also encouraged other revolts, and this is probably the greatest tragedies. Although Phokas and Semiskis were both very capable generals, they needed each other. And when Semiskis kills Phokas, the sense that, hey, time, time for Semiskis to go, next general to take over, uh, spread as well. You had a general de destabilization of the military and the government. So the power base is weakened at the very time when it could have been its strongest. Uh, Zemiskis drives the, drives the Muslim uh, occupation back to its, its uh, almost to its roots. He goes as far as Jerusalem, takes over most of what's, you know, called the Holy Land, and is in control of Asia Minor. But he has a destabilized power base at home. He has the threat of civil war constantly. He manages to handle it okay uh, for his lifetime, and that doesn't last very long. Nikephoros and Semiskis together could be seen as reestablishing, uh, turning back the expansion of Islam and reestablishing the Romans, as they thought of themselves, of course, as the military and economic power of the Mediterranean Sea. But Semiskis doesn't, again, live past... Uh, t uh, 976. Their domestic policies always work to, to support the theme idea of having citizen soldiers, the, uh, the idea of, of, of supporting soldiers through these gifts of land where they could actually live off the land um, as a bequest from the state. And this also functionally put a check on the landed aristocrats. They could not continue gaining power because the, the power of the peasantry the soldiers themselves had to be maintained. You always wonder, had Phokas and Semiskis worked together, what would have been different? But, of course, Semiskis kills Phokas, and although he maintains the momentum to a point, uh, you, can see, you can see that there's going to be trouble afterward. In 976, Semiskis died suddenly, and the actual Macedonian emperor, Basil II, was suddenly in power, or at least it looked that way. The reality is the 18-year-old Basil II had about 10 years of civil war to deal with because of the, the destabilization of, of Byzantine society after the uh, murder of Phokas by Tzimiskis. Civil war was probably inevitable. You just didn't have the strong personality of Tzimiskis to, to keep it in check any longer. And there were plenty of other people who believed that they should be in power. The expectation was that someone would actually rule other than whoever the Macedonian emperor was. They, they, they knew that the real power was usually a, uh, somebody behind the throne. And for ten years, Basil faced first Bardas Skleros as a usurper who felt that he should have the power, and then his, the, the very people who supported him against Skleros, uh, the Chamberlain, uh, Basil, confusing that, and the uh, General Bardas Phokas, who had worked together to, to defeat Skleros, they themselves attempted to maintain power in place of Basil II. Basil himself only took power through the intervention of someone who was not a contender for the throne of Constantinople itself. And this is where the Rus lord in 988, Vladimir of Kiev, enters the picture. In return for his assistance, Vladimir came with some 6,000 Vikings from the Rus valley and put down all other contenders to the throne. Vladimir received the hand of, hand of Basil's sister, Anna, and he entered fully into the Byzantine Confederacy by converting to Eastern Christianity. 
and thereby bringing along the Rus tribes as well. Russian attention remained focused on its own affairs in the north and, and west, but they fully thought of themselves from this point onward as part of the Byzantine world. Uh, the conversion of the Rus under Vladimir ensured the continuation of Byzantine culture and worldview long after the fall of Constantinople, and the Russian Tsar is the next chapter in Byzantine, in Byzantine cultural development. After he had gained power finally for himself, Basil maintained the borders and stability of the empire, but the rise of the Bulgar Samuel, which Bulgars, whenever, whenever they see an attempt to demonstrate that the ruler of Constantinople is weak, will take that and suggest that they should be the real power in the Balkans. Samuel does this. This forced Basil to focus most of his military attention on the Balkans and away from the Islamic uh, frontier that Samiskis and Phokas had established. Minor fighting dominates the Balkans until a major battle, the Battle of Clydeon in 1014, completely shifts power to Basil. The battle is a rout. The Bulgars are, are defeated soundly, although uh, Samuel, the Bulgar Tsar, the Bulgar Emperor, uh, flees the battle and survives. He's in for a rude awakening. Basil is tired of the Bulgar threat and wants it gone for good. We don't know for sure how many thousand captive Bulgars uh, Basil took. Uh, 14,000 is, is the number we're given by the historian Michael Sellis. But his way of dealing with them was to blind them all in groups of hundreds. So there would be a hundred blind men with one one-eyed man leading them back to the back to the capital of the Bulgars. Uh, each century, each then uh, fraction of a legion would, would be paraded into, uh, into the Bulgar capital, led by the one-eyed man, and this was, this was too much for Samuel to take. Word has it that he died of shock. Uh, he apparently had a stroke or something after seeing all of his army returning blinded and completely incapable of fighting. By 1018, then, it's safe to say that the Bulgars were no longer a power in the Balkans. Their, their lands had been divided into themes. The uh, governance, direct governance of the emperor was established, although the emperor did give them religious autonomy. Uh, this, this act, which appears to be something of a, of a concession to Bulgar freedom, is really a way of the emperor maintaining more direct control. It works like this. If the Bulgars don't have religious autonomy, then the Patriarch of Constantinople is going to be ultimately in charge of the Bulgar church. If the Bulgars do have religious autonomy, then the person who serves as Patriarch of the Bulgars, or the Archbishop of Bulgaria, is really chosen or hand-picked by uh, by the emperor himself. So the emperor has more control by keeping the patriarch out of control of, uh, of the Bulgar church. He has far more choice then in how Bulgarian affairs are run. The Arab threat was next on the list of Basil II. He realized that you couldn't ignore the expansion of Islam for long, and especially the, uh, the problem in in the Mediterranean. Nikephoros Phokas had reconquered Crete, but with the fall of Phokas, Crete couldn't be maintained by the Byzantines, and it fell back into the hands of it, what were functionally pirates, Islamic pirates, and, and this remained a constant threat during the period of uh, the 11th century. Basil II knows something must be done about this, but he dies before he can do anything. This effectively signals the decline of Byzantium. He reigned for a long 50 years. It was fairly stable. The empire was fairly stable. The economy was fairly stable. And now it starts going down. Basil's brother Constantine VIII, who had never shown any real interest in ruling, he preferred to let his brother do that, and he would simply enjoy the finer things that court life had to offer, he takes over, but 
A, he's old, and B, he doesn't really understand what Basil had been had been doing. So he's most of a placeholder, mostly a placeholder for about three years here. 1928. It should say 1028. That's my typo. In 1028, Constantine's elderly daughters inherited the throne after Constantine VIII did basically nothing. So Zoe and Theodora are then the uh, what's left of the Macedonian dynasty. In 1028, Zoe married Romanus Argyros, the first of a series of emperors who were part of the city aristocracy of Constantinople. And we have a series of emperors then from 1028 to the 1070s who really concern themselves almost exclusively with domestic issues, including arts, learning, and culture. It's a great time for the reestablishment of learning, for the, uh, um, for the development of Byzantine culture, the Byzantine university. They, I guess we could call it that. It's really, Gregory does, it's really kind of misnamed. But the Byzantine Academy of Learning is reestablished in Constantinople under the leadership of Michael Selos during this period. But the ignorance of both the economy and the military is going to, uh, is going to lead to a rapid, rapid crisis by the end of the century. This is a period when Byzantium was focused on itself. Military and economic dominance were assumed, and because they assumed that they would never lose military and economic dominance, they wound up losing military and economic dominance in the Mediterranean. Zoe didn't particularly like Romanos because he ignored her. Uh, we're looking at a number of women who, who see to the murder of their emperor husbands. Um, Romanos is murdered. Michael the Paphlagonian takes over and marries Zoe, who is starting to get old. The real power behind the throne, however, is the eunuch John the Orphanotrophos, I love that name, John the Orphanotropha. Somebody ought to just pick up that name and, and adopt it for themselves. John recognized a looming financial crisis. He could see that there were problems that had to be faced, or <laughs> you think you're facing a fiscal cliff, American types? This was a serious problem. The empire itself would be, uh, would be completely insolvent. His way of dealing it with it, however, caused more problems than it solved. Extremely high tax uh, rates as a way of trying to balance the books of the of the central government also made a tremendous number of enemies for John throughout the empire. What was intended then to balance the economy wound up destabilizing the empire as revolts against his policy meant that power became increasingly localized. People simply didn't. They refused to pay their taxes. Pardon me, needed a drink. And so local power in the themes was really where, where things were, were headed. When Orphanotrophus selected a successor for Michael IV, who had died suddenly, and that successor, Michael V, tried to seize all power, for once the aristocracy thought or acted as one, acted in, in unity, and said, no way, Zoe and Theodora must remain the power, whoever else... Uh, whoever else actually governs, we can't, we can't abandon the actual dynasty of the Macedonians. Zoe married again, uh, this time Constantine IX uh, became emperor. Constantine maintained the policy of the good life, you know, enjoying the, the domestic side of, of Constantinople and the empire. And to cut expenses, because they were still having a financial crisis, he simply cut the military one of the few things that kept Byzantium um, alive. This would have real consequences, as you might imagine. It wasn't enough to balance the books, so he took another step. And this is interesting. I want you American types to pay attention to this. He debased the currency. He decreased the value of gold in the actual gold coins, the solidity of the, of the empire, the numa, uh, the the basic currency. This gave him more coins to spend, but it meant that each coin was worth less. You recall, the same thing happened in the third century that led to the crisis that Diocletian had to fix 
by force at the turn of the 4th century. Never in the history of humanity has the currency been dis debased by a government, and it has not led to spiraling inflation and serious economic crisis. All you're doing is, is buying off time and making sure the crisis is pushed off a little bit down the road. Now, I want you to think about this because for the last, oh, 10, 15 years, your government's been debasing the American currency far faster than the Byzantine Empire debased its currency. Of course, this will probably be all right because America is always okay. It never, it never will have a serious crisis. This, at least, is what I was assured by listening to the head of the Federal Reserve explain that even though it's never happened in human history, that a country has debased its currency and survived financially, not gone through the crisis of spiraling inflation, we don't have to worry about it now because we live in a different time and, and there are mechanisms in America which will prevent this crisis from occurring. So, don't worry kids, I'm sure it'll all be just fine. Um, I, I may sound like I'm full of doom and gloom suggesting that that America's headed for a crisis, but Keep in mind, it's only because it's never happened in human history that anyone has debased their currency and not faced a crisis. There's a first time for everything, and I'm sure America will face that, and you'll all be okay. If you learn the lessons of history, however, there might be another effect. Uh, that will be your problem. I'm financially solvent, and I own my own shack. In effect, by the death of Constantine the Ninth in 1055, Byzantine power was an illusion. And I'm sure this would never happen to America, uh, just because. In any war, there was not the manpower to actually succeed. The military was gutted and replaced with mercenaries. Economically, the Byzantine Empire was no longer the basis of the Mediterranean market. Debasing their currency meant that they were shoved aside, and although there wasn't a clear uh, single uh, winner of, of the power vacuum that inevitably would follow, the, uh, the rise of the Venetians and the economic uh, climb of the Islamic caliphates was inevitable. This, with, with the decline of Byzantium, something, something would change, and, and these, these two powers did rise, as did the Norman presence in southern Italy as a trade and economic power. The illusion of power was only maintained during this period because of the, de the decline of the Abbasid Caliphate. Um, since they were declining too, oh, that might be a little bit like all of the economies of the world uh, debasing their currency at the same time. That would never happen, or I guess it is. Uh, but I'm sure it'll all be okay after all the chairman of the Federal Reserve said it would be fine. But because the Abbasids were also declining at the same time, the illusion that somehow Byzantium was not so bad off could be maintained for a few years. The relative peace of the Balkans after the defeat of the Bulgars also contributed to this sense of general well-being, even though the economy, uh, the economy was rapidly deteriorating. It would have been interesting if the two revolts that occurred under Constantine the Ninth, under the generals George Maniakis and Leo Tornikas, succeeded. Uh, both of them had revolted precisely because they saw the economic and military decline, and they were revolting as a way of turning that around. Um, they didn't succeed. Fate intervened, and they they lost their bids for power. Constantine the Ninth maintained his power, and the kind of the, the merry decline of all things Byzantine and continued. 1054 is a significant date, and you're going to need to know it for the final exam. This is the year where the cultural differences separating the Eastern and Western churches finally result in a mutual excommunication, and so the division of Christendom is permanent. Um, you no longer have a single united church. To some degree... It's somewhat anticlimactic to talk about 1054 as a major date even in church history. After all, we know from the time of, uh, of St. Photius of the East that the differences between East and West were clearly recognized, 
and this is this seems to have been inevitable looking back at the series of events. Um, the attempt of the popes, and Leo the Ninth is only the most recent in this in this discussion. The attempts of the pope to have absolute power over the Byzantine churches were resented by the Byzantines. The idea that there was one earthly head of the church is something that's never been accepted in Eastern Christianity, and they weren't about to start in 1054. So, to some degree, looking at the, the grand sweep of events, 1054 was simply putting a, an official separation uh, marker to, to a separation culturally and intellectually, which had been going on uh, since the 5th century at the very least. On the other hand, we can look at it another way. 1054 is also rather unimpressive because nothing really changes. The division, the cultural division that was there continues, the theological division that was there continues, and on the ground, people on the border states, uh, the eastern Christians that, that uh, border upon, say, what we now think of as the Czech area, the Czech Republic. They don't change their relations with their, their Western Christian neighbors. Um, nobody particularly stops communing one another in the borderlands, in Romania and, and Hungary. But the, uh, the principle of division is official, and it certainly remains. So... 1054, do keep it on your radar, even though we have to qualify the discussion a bit. While this division is hardly surprising, it does add one more feature to what would come next. And what would come next is the military and economic crisis, which the West has come to call the Crusades. Had the churches not divided, you'd have a very different diplomatic state of affairs, uh, calling for aid from the West to fight off the expansion of Islam would have taken a little different form, and indeed could have taken a little different form, if you aren't also asking for help from somebody who's been denounced as a heretic. After Constantine the Ninth, there's a series of, of uh, military coups, which we should be getting used to. It's always a sign that nothing's particularly healthy. The next major emperor was Constantine Dukas, Constantine the Tenth. And what he did was basically ensure that the economic and military decline, which, which was going on, sped up. Greater expenses, greater extravagance um, in Constantinople, and the selling off of military titles. If you were in the military, you could buy off your title, so you didn't have to serve anymore. Uh, you basically bought your freedom from the government. And this isn't a great way to maintain this isn't a great way to maintain a military force. After Constantine Dukas, Constantine's widow, Evdokia, uh, marries Romano, Romanos IV. Now, Romanos sees that there's a real problem with a weak military. He's aware of something that Constantine Dukas had apparently been ignoring. Uh, Islam's expanding, and the mili the eastern frontier is, is one episode after another of military failure. Why Constantinople isn't paying attention to this when it's clearly when it's clearly going on, I don't know. It it just it it's it just boggles my mind. Um, your your entire empire is shrinking in size while you do nothing. You sell off the military as a way of 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 ignoring the problem, I guess. Romanus realizes that things are getting quite serious, but there's no money left. The money is worth nothing, so there's no economic basis to build back the army. What he's left with is increasing the number of poorly paid, note that, mercenaries. A lot of Norman adventurers came over to see what they could do in the Byzantine enterprise, and they received very little money for their for their trouble, but they did, they did have a sense that if they stuck around long enough, they might be able to uh, get some get some fairly fine pickings off the empire itself. In other words, mercenaries, as Machiavelli would warn uh, a few hundred years later, mer mercenaries are worth exactly what they cost. 
when you pay for soldiers, you either pay so well that they would never desert you, or you're buying people whose loyalty is to money rather than to a political cause. And indeed, that was the case. The Seljuk Turks under, I love this name, Alp Arslan, you've got to do something with that in cartoons, Alp Arslan, leader of the Seljuk Turks, had been making headway in Asia Minor during the reign of Constantine X, and it's clear, Romanus knows this, it's clear that a major confrontation is coming, and so he assembles the largest force he can. The confrontation occurs in 1071 at Mansikert, in modern, what we know as in modern-day Armenia. Romanos had used his money as efficiently as he could, and he had a force of nearly 200,000. But when the battle began, a significant number of them didn't bother fighting in behalf of the Byzantine Empire. The Norman mercenaries that he had paid for fled. The only people remaining on the field were the actual Byzantine army, which, of course, had been gutted in uh, in previous reigns. Is it possible, oh yeah, that the Norman mercenaries had been bought off by the Seljuk Turks? After all, they're, they're fighting for money. Pay them more not to fight, and they, they could say, sure, we get more money for not fighting uh, if the Seljuks are paying us than we would for fighting in behalf of the empire. Loyalty is, is in short supply in dealing with mercenaries, as Machiavelli would warn later. So I suspect they were. We don't have solid evidence of this, but generally, generally when mercenaries just don't bother to fight, it means somebody else has, has upped, upped the pay a bit and bought them off. The second day of the battle, the fact that the Byzantines made it through the first was largely a result of Romanus's own uh, cleverness and a certain amount of, of uh, charisma on his end. He had a lot of people who followed him. But in the second day of the battle, as he was taking it to the Turks, and it looked like he might actually have a chance of winning, the general and his political rival, Adronikos Dukas, that's, yes, a relative of Constantine Dukas, spread the rumor that the emperor had been killed. What happens is then the main Byzantine force decides the battle's over, the emperor's been killed, and the, uh, the Turks... At the very point when the, when the Byzantines look like they might have a chance of winning, the Turks sweep the field as the Byzantines collapse under the rumor that the emperor has been killed. Which raises another question. Had Lucas been bought off? Good question. Uh, it's clear that he wanted power in his own hands and not in the hands of his rival, uh, Romanos IV. But would, this, would the Turks work through him to to basically undercut the entire military effort of Romanos and would Dukas himself have so little so little uh, uh, love of country that he would do so yeah yeah that's right he would and we see that in what follows very few people understood just what peril the empire was in and they were willing to turn on one another at will, using the Turks, using the, the, uh, the enemy as their ally, if, that were, if that's what did it. Romanos does survive the battle, but he's taken prisoner, and effectively, Asia Minor is abandoned to the Turks as the aristocratic generals scramble back for Constantinople. Fleeing the Battle of Manzikert, they need to, they need to try to get power themselves. And so the internal fighting of the aristocrats continues, and the empire is in serious, serious trouble. Asia Minor is lost. It is now a Turkish uh, conquest, which has something to do with the reason we call it Turkey today. Uh, more on that later. Although Michael Dukas VII, of his name, maintained power for seven years after the battle, that's not to be confused with any type of imperial stability. It's basically a condition of low-grade civil war during the entire reign of Michael Dukas and until uh, 1081. In 1081, one of the very few capable generals and administrators out there, Alexios Komnenos, takes the throne, and he does so specifically to fix the problems. He inherits 
a debased economy. The, um, the coinage is worth one-third of what it should be worth. And he inherits a, uh, a military catastrophe of ex you know, expanding Islam under the Seljuk Turks. He does manage to turn the empire around, which is going to be the material of the next lecture. But by the time he, he's in power, he can only do so one way. His success would come at a cost. Outside help was desperately needed against the Seljuk Turks on the eastern border, and this, this is the crisis which precipitates what you Westerners call the Crusades. Just a couple of comments on that as I wrap up this, this brief lecture in chapter 11. I think it behooves you to learn the lessons of history uh, and say, maybe it's not a good thing. This is me preaching for a minute. Maybe it's not a good thing that your government continually debases your own currency. Maybe there's something else going on that is not going to be healthy for your own particular, your own particular Republic of America. Another thing I want to bring to your attention is this concept of the Crusades. There's a lot of really dumbass ideas being circulated about the Crusades basically being a bunch of Western boors waging war on a whole bunch of innocent people in the East who happen to be not Christian. That ignores Byzantium. The Byzantine Empire uh, must be seen as the central player in what develops as the so-called Crusades. It isn't a bunch of Western people saying, oh, let's go fight for Jesus and kill a bunch of brown people along the way. That's a dumb view of history. It's supported by your media. It's supported by PBS. It's supported by your textbooks that somehow manage to ignore the Christian East entirely. And also, major Jewish empires. Oh, was there a major Jewish empire? Indeed there was. For some time now, we've been talking about the Khazars. They've de declined uh, with the rise of the Rus, but the Khazars were, by religion, Jewish. So there are major powers other than Islam in the East, and these major powers are precisely what the West chooses to ignore when recasting history as if the Crusades are a Western event um, performed by Western Christians on Eastern non-Christian peoples. It's yet another way to get history wrong, it ignores the real political balance and the real struggle that both the, uh, the Turks and, uh, and the Byzantines were aware of. And it does no particular good uh, for recasting the history of the West either. Those who went on the Crusades may have gone for some very strange reasons by our standards, instant access to heaven being one of them, but very few of them were under the illusion that they were somehow um, not fighting in defense of Eastern Christendom. They got the political power struggle in a way that we now ignore. I'm not sure where that goes and where it doesn't. I do know that, for whatever reasons, you're, uh, <laughs> you've been brainwashed, to be honest, into thinking that, that uh, history is very different than it actually was. Pay attention to these things. They do matter. They matter because when you look around yourself today, you may see the upshot of the Crusades. Hmm, go figure. And you may need to take a step back and realize what the Islamic world really is. Take Dr. Stanfield Johnson's courses. You may need to realize what the Eastern world really is. Take Dr. Pogorelskin's courses. And you may need to face how history actually occurred. Uh, we do ourselves no favors by retelling it in such a way that, uh, that the major players of the time are ignored. Okay, enough, is, enough of a sermon. Much more to say. Do take notes. Do ask questions. I'd be happy to talk on these issues further. And, uh, and enjoy the decline of your economy and spiraling inflation. I'm sure it'll all be okay. On that cheery note, have a happy Thanksgiving, and I'll see you on the other side Wednesday, the 28th of November.